Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, dearest guests. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you, President Chimo Perez, and we are honored to have the President with us today. President Chimo Perez is the senior statesman of the Middle East and a world-renowned politician. In a career spanning more than 65 years, President Perez has served as Prime Minister twice. In 1994, President Perez won the Nobel Peace Prize and has worked day and night to bring his message of peace and friendship to people around the Middle East and the world. With dozens of YouTube videos, thousands of Twitter followers, a very public launch of his Facebook page with Mark Zuckerberg, and now the first world leader first world leader to invite people from around the world to an online one-on-one -on -one conversation, you would be hard-pressed to find a head of state who has so successfully used social media to better the world and to shape our tomorrow. The freedom of express expression that new media platforms provide is something that is of deep importance to President Perez. Similarly, the words that you write every day on your blogs, providing hope, guidance, counsel, comfort, and humor to your readers, is deeply valued by the President, and it is safe to say that if he had a bit more time on his hands, President Paris would certainly be one of the world's most prolific bloggers. President Perez, it is an honor to have you at our bloggers session this morning. Sitting in front of you are bloggers from across Israel and around the world. They have been covering the panels and sessions at this year's conference and are very much looking forward to their conversation with you this morning. Okay, so now... <laughs> I think by describing my biography, you omitted one thing. It's true I was twice foreign minister, but I was also once the minister of religion. Please don't forget it. I, I used to be the cabinet secretary four and a half years, so I know. I used to be the cabinet secretary, so I know how many times you were minister. If I will start counting it, we will leave at 8 o'clock this evening. Okay, starting. We will be the first one. Please go ahead. Thank you, President Perez. My name is Scott Johnson. I'm here from St. Paul, Minnesota. I write for the blog Powerline in the United States. Sir, I have a question for you about Iran and Syria. In the most recent interview I saw that you did with CNN in the past few days, you referred to where we are with Iran as being at the end of the beginning or the beginning of the end. I wondered if you would explain what you meant by that and if you would talk a little bit about Iran's relationship with Syria in this context. Thank you. Thank you. The real problem about Iran is not that we don't like the Iranians. The problem is the Iranian menace to the world. It's their initiative. If they wouldn't do it, I don't think anybody would say a word against Iran. The Iranian people are not our enemies. It's a small group of people that today runs Iran. And they want, for example, to take over the Middle East. The world cannot agree to it. A, there is an end of imperialism, and we don't want to have another empire. Secondly, the people in the Middle East don't want to fall under the spell of Iran. Thirdly, the Iranians are using means which are too dangerous, like terror or nuclear bombs. So they didn't leave us a choice. I mean, us, not the Israelis, but all people all over the world. Because terror is global, they don't identify, identify themselves. 
they don't even address, they don't care responsibility. And for that reason, I think the, the world does not have a choice but to prevent them from conquering the Middle East, for building a bomb, for using their own. I think it's right and normal to start to prevent it, not by military means, if you can do it economically or politically, it's better. So the sanctions were taken, they had an impact. They brought the Iranian to the negotiating table, but the Iranian came in half-hearted. They thought, let's talk a little bit, maybe this coalition will fall to pieces, and then we should be able to return. And because of it, President Obama said, all options are on the table. It's not a saying, it's a must. The world cannot really take an aggression, a terroristic aggression, and nuclear weapons together. So, uh, since the Iranians didn't take, in my judgment, enough the seriousness of the danger they create, they played in the negotiations, the negotiations until now failed. There was not much time because the Iranians are continuing to do the same thing. They didn't stop. And for that reason, I think if they won't meet the warnings, the calls, the economic sanctions, the world will look for other options. Thank you. That's what I meant. Hi, President Perez. First of all, thank you for creating this conference and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Marnie Mandel. I blog for the Times of Israel and I live in Tel Aviv. Um, I had the honor of posing this question to Yossi Vardy just before this and I'd like to pose it to you. Currently, 15% of the high-tech workforce is comprised of women in leadership roles. You can say 15% of leadership roles in high-tech companies are comprised of women. Approximately the same are in government positions of leadership here and in corporate leadership. What do you think that Israel can do to help raise these numbers and support more women in leadership roles? You know, in the office I work in, President's office, the majority are women. They are the bosses. And I think people that don't take advantage of the human talent are mistaken. So the men have to learn a little bit. And they will learn. And I want to tell you, if you don't find this, you should tell it in the right way. Every woman is born like a mother. And every man passes away like a baby. He never matures. <laughs> so better have a motherly man management than a fatherly management. <laughs> and for that reason, I think this is a mistake that will be corrected the more we shall understand what women are and what are women. Every woman is a civilization in our own right. Men are more alike. Women are more individual. And we live in a world where individuality is the best defense against globality. So the future is with you. Good morning, Mr. President. Thank you for opening up this forum. My name is Eitan Press. I dominate for the Huffington Post on religion. And my question for you is if I were going to the Kotel to talk to God, what would you ask me to pray for concerning Israel? <laughs> that we shall follow the advice of the God. Well, really, what I mean is that, you know, the growth in our concept is not some, something which is 50-50.
physical or visible uh, can approach and so on. The God resides in each of us. And He guides us. He gives us advices. He doesn't have any dictatorial means. We can follow Him, we cannot follow Him. I think it's uh, true about all believers, not only Jewish. So please ask Him to continue to give us the right advice and we shall do the right things. Thank you. President Perez, my name is Adam Scott Bellis. I blog for the Jerusalem Post. It's nice to see you again. The conference is great, just like last year. Uh, over the past couple of days, the South has been drained with rockets from Gaza. I think the number was at 100, if I'm correct. Um, it's been years since we've pulled out of Gaza, and the situation has increased in danger, I guess, for the people of the South. When is time, or when is it going to be time to say enough is enough with rockets being trained down the South? Well, we are like it every day, you know. We don't collect angles. And that's the reason why now, again, the Gazian turn to the Egyptians and suggest there will be a ceasefire. They must make a choice, the Gazians. What do they want? To run Gaza or to run terror? If they will run Gaza, Israel will make is it as possible as it's, we can. We don't want to see the Gazian people suffer. The only one that can make them suffer are the ones who are using rockets against us. But if they'll continue to lose, why are we not have a choice but to stop it? And for that reason you see a sort of reluctance even in Gaza. Because in order to run life in Gaza, they have to stop shooting. If they will shoot, they won't be able to run Gaza. And what is the purpose of their shooting? Why are they shooting? There is no Israel in Gaza. No Israeli soldier in Gaza. They are free. It's open. What do they want? Why are they doing it? And I'm not asking as an Israeli. I think the question is being asked by the Gazian people too. One fact which is unknown. You know, there was a competition between Hamas, which is running Gaza, and Fatah, which is running the West Bank. According to the Arab polls, the majority of the Gazian people are for Fatah, not for Hamas. That's what it means. They want to live. And what the, the people that shoot the rockets are doing, they make the life of Gaza miserable. Clearly, we cannot take it that our mothers we will not be able to sleep at night. What are they doing? Why? What for? And they started to build in Gaza. There was a good economy. They are endangering their own people. So I hope they'll draw the right conclusions. Mr. President, my name is Safra Turner Granot. I'm a blogger for the Times of Israel. First of all, as everyone says, thank you very much for putting together this conference. It's a wonderful place to exchange ideas. Um, I'm actually asking a question as the founder of Olim for Improving Israel. It's a grassroots lobby here in Israel to reconnect Israel and the Jewish world through Olim by Choice. My question is, what do you feel is the ability of a grassroots organization here in Israel to be able to enact policy change in the Knesset with the current political structure that, that we have right now in the Knesset? The basic change is not a system of government, but a system of elections. I mean, people say better a presidential system than a parliamentary one. Well, each of them has advantages and shortages. But if you have the wrong electoral system, the number of parties in the parliament 
does not enable neither a presidential system nor a parliamentarian system to succeed. If you have 14 parties in the parliament, you cannot really manage a country. So the main thing to do is to change the electoral system by raising the limit of the number of uh, the percentage of the vote. Today it's one and a half percent in Israel, in the world, and most of the democratic countries it is at least five percent. And if you have one and a half percent, you prize every division. If you have five percent, you prize unity and the smaller number of parties. If you have uh, say regional elections, then people elect people. When you have proportional elections, people elect parties. So I think where we have really to handle the shortage is in changing the electoral system. And then we have primaries in the parties, which again is very difficult to be elected. You have to collect money, you have to collect uh, negotiators to bring you people. I think the second change in order to improve the elections is to have the primaries not party-wise, but nation-wise. Every party can have a candidate. Every citizen has the right to vote once for a party. But you don't know who the voters are. So you don't have to pay them, you don't have to do them favors, let them have a free election. If these two amendments will take place, I think the democratic system in Israel will improve greatly. Hi, I'm Esther Kostanowicz. I'm a writer and blogger based in Los Angeles. And I know that you were just in Washington, D.C. receiving an honor from the President of the United States, Barack Obama. I'm wondering if you can share some reflections on your time in Washington with the President. Well, I felt, uh, I'm not saying it just of modesty, that the real recipient of the prize were the Israeli people. I was just imagining. You know, there were uh, 15 prizes given to American citizens and one to a non American, a foreigner. And uh, I thought about it. There are 200 countries that are foreign countries, many of them, by the way have uh, people who came from their countries, like Italians, like Greeks, many others. So it wasn't a political consideration. I think this was a salute to Israel, for showing that democracy can withstand shortages, difficulties, and wars, and never have a day of war postponed a day of freedom. I was very proud that this recognition was given to our people. And I asked myself again why. Because uh, as a student of history, I think what is unique about America is it that America is the only power in history that got its strength, not by taking, but by giving. When you look at American history, it's a history of generosity and not the history of occupation. And it's fascinating to think about it. They helped many other countries to regain their freedom, their independence, their broken economies. Marshall Plan. They made, they introduced the democracy in uh, Japan, in Germany. They didn't, they won the wars. Our young Americans lost their lives. They won wars, they won assets, they gave everything back. 
So this is a new concept about the strength of generosity. And I think occasionally generosity is a greater power than power. Then goodwill is an unbelievable strength. And I think that's why the spirit of saluting Israel in that respect was for me very moving. And if you permit me to say, I found the president extremely charming on a personal level and a thoughtful man and he thinks what he does. So for me it was really a great occasion. I was happy to represent our people in getting this distinction. Thank you. Mr. Perez, my name is Israel Rosenberg. I live in Jerusalem. I'm from the United States. I've, uh, I'm a blogger for the Times of Israel, and I've just completed a book on the prophecy of the prophets and how it relates to our future as a people. We have someone that we talk about called the Jose of Lublin, who was a Talmud Chacham. But I think you, Mr. Perez, are the Jose of Yerushalayim. And this is one of the chief talents that you have for us. Can you please tell me, to what degree do you see the positive prophet prophecies of the Hebrew prophets actually reflecting what will be the future of the Jewish people? I think more than it is a distinction clearly between the past and the future. You know, the Hebrew language is very impatient. We don't have really three times past, present, and future. What we have in the Hebrew language is two times, past and future. Everything either happened or will happen. There's nothing on the waiting list. So the advice of the prophet is referring to the future more than to the past because the past is unchangeable. You cannot change. One of our rabbis asked Ben Gurion, what is the only thing that the Lord in heaven cannot do? And we were surprised to hear it from a religious rabbi. And then the rabbi told him, what the Lord cannot do is to change the past. What the man can do is to change the future. And the prophets advise you in which way to change the future. Mr. President, uh, Guy Su, I blog for the Huffington Post to teach at American University School of International Service. You've spent your entire career fighting for peace and security for the state of Israel. And some observers in recent years have been arguing that time is running out for a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. How viable is a Palestinian state and what specifically needs to be done to bring about a final peace deal? Well, uh, the right thing is to make this right away so it won't run out. But I want to tell you, you need also patience in, in life. Uh, you know, uh, we, Dr. Kahneman quotes Danny Kay. Danny Kay said once, I like sport, but one sport I don't like, and that is jumping. Because if you train on jumping, you jump to conclusions. Don't jump to conclusions. If somebody say time is out, is jumping to conclusion. There are things that take times. There are things that have setbacks and failures. Don't lose your heart. There is no better solution. And they trust the one for the Palestinians and us than to have two states living in peace and trying to help each other instead of fighting each other. So I don't accept this jumping conclusion that the time is over. There is no time there are human beings and we are not over. And this remains the best solution.
My name is Paula Stern, and I blog at a Soldier's Mother. And um, my question is a very simple one, Jonathan Pollard. Um, you talked about patience, you talked about time running out, um, you talked about basically where we're going. Um, you just received the Medal of Freedom. I actually was hoping that you would take it on Wednesday when you received it with all of our gratitude from all of the State of Israel. And I was hoping that on Thursday you would have given it to Jonathan Pollard. What can Israel do? Because the situation is untenable. He should not be there. There is no justice in what's been done to him. Obviously, we know the whole history of what he has done. The question is, what can Israel do? Well, you know, uh, there was one thing which is similar between the President of the United States and the President of Israel. Not many. He really runs the country. I'm just uh, trying to represent them. But one thing that I have in authority is uh, really to forgive. And uh, there is a logic to it. My right to pardon or to forgive is not an extension of the judicial process. I am not above the court. But the country trusted me that I can consider things which are not strictly legal, but strictly humane. My consideration is not what is written in the books of the law. I have to know it, clearly. But what is written in the book of your heart. And there are cases which are heartbreaking. You put a mother in prison, and you put the children in prison. We have a sick person. So my consideration are purely humane, out of the box. And I'm very careful to be as fair to the person and true to the justice. So I spoke with President Obama. And I appeal in the name of the humanitarian side that they could do. Now, we are not permitted to give our reasons, not to give our considerations, because it is a totally individual judgment. And we don't want even to publish like a doctor what was the illness, what was the sickness, what was the consideration. So I won't reveal what took place between us, but the basis of it, the basis was humanitarian, the fact that Poland is 26 years in prison, that his health is failing. So I didn't appear as a court of appeal, but as a person to person that were uh, charged or given the, the, the right to judge humanly, not only legally. That's what they could do, that's what they did, that's what they should continue to do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My name is Sarah Vanunu. Uh, I'm one of the founders of NAPID, the Coalition for High School Age Programs in Israel, and I blog for the Times of Israel. My question is to do with repressed civilization, such as we see in Syria, uh, their inability to, to better their situation or revolutionize themselves through the use of the internet. What would be your advice for, for these people? What are your thoughts? You know, there were times that people didn't intervene in the affairs of other people. No more. Since the Shoah, and the killing. Indifference is no longer a bore. If you see something that you cannot support, it's not enough that you will condemn it. You have tried to stop it. And people say, well, if uh, you get rid of Assad, 
you won't find a better alternative. In my judgment, Assad stopped to be an alternative. It's not an alternative. Even if you don't know who will replace him. A man that kills his own babies. And one of those shocking things I experienced in my life <coughs> is to see a small coffin and there is a baby that was killed brutally, all blooded. Nothing is that. But there is a dilemma how to handle it. For example, if the United States will try to intervene, they will say it's a foreign intervention. Suppose the United States will not intervene, they say the United States is indifferent. Yeah, I think Kofi Annan came with a good idea, and that is to match the United Nations and the Arab League. The Arab League say they represent the Arab people. They say they cannot stand the murderous regime in Syria. I think the right thing to do is that the United States, United Nations, will empower the Arab League to introduce the change. So it will be done by the Arabs. And I appreciate two things, what's happening in the Arab world. It makes upon me a very profound impression. One is the revolt against Assad, that every day people are demonstrating for their freedom in face of fire and losing their heart. You know, it's very brave, very courageous, very moving. And the other is that Arab League say, we can't stand it. So they say, okay. Until now, the Arab League gave advice to other people what to do. Let them handle the situation. And let the United Nations support it. I think this would be management, the best approach to overcome the dilemma that we are watching now in Syria. President Paris, thank you again for this opportunity. I'm, my name is Ruth. I'm here with I Googled, I Googled Israel. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick, simple question for the gentleman and accomplished uh, distinguished gentleman that you are, what would be on your wish list for your next birthday present? That <laughs> <laughs> all other people will really have happy birthdays. Thank you, Mr. President, for joining us. Thank you.